Welcome everyone. Welcome to part four of our webinar series today, this morning or this evening. Hi everyone, welcome. As Debbie said, thank you so much for joining us today uh, from wherever you are in the world. And we so appreciate your interest and look forward to sharing some insights with you. Tonight, I'm joined by Debbie Gilmore, Executive Director of Aerosmith, and members of our marketing team, Emily and Sojin. These terrific people will be helping us through the session, including sharing links in the chat section, gathering your questions, and finding out more about you. Lots of parents in the audience, a good amount of, of educators too, variety of professional backgrounds, Lovely. Okay. All really helpful and makes a lot of sense. Uh, we've always said if you're anyone with a brain or working uh, with someone with one, which is a pretty universal experience, uh, then some of this work may be of interest to you. Move on. Although first, uh, just a bit of a quick overview of some of the themes we've covered so far. As some of you may know, this is the fourth of a series of five uh, webinars we've had over the last several months, and you're welcome actually to participate retroactively in those uh, in that series. Uh, both Debbie and myself have shared some Aerosmith uh, perspectives about cognitive programming and, and the field uh, that we are in. So Emily can pop those uh, registration into the chat and you can have a look at some of the previous sessions. So, so far we've covered some kind of fundamental truths. Uh, the first that each of us carry around a beautiful three pound mass in our skulls. Uh, and this determines everything we do and say and think and how we go about in the world. Uh, and that it's highly specialized and highly unique. Uh, in fact, our cognitive profiles are as unique as our, fi our fingerprints due to the range of cognitive capacities we each have across a range of cognitive processes. So this unique cognitive makeup really shapes our every experience. Also importantly, that we can change that experience, that we can change our cognitive profiles, that through neuroplastic applications, both learning and uh, targeted can strengthen specific cognitive functions to enhance our performance, our quality of lives. This is central to our work here at Aerosmith uh, through our school and programs around the world. Also, that we can take this lens through all the different ways humanity can take advantage of neuroplastic approaches. So in the workplace, at home, in health, in wellness, in recovery, uh, preventatively to deeply enhance the quality of our lives and society as a whole. And finally, this led us kind of naturally to the most recent session last month where Debbie Gilmore encouraged us to sort of conceptualize transforming a system of particular interest to many of us here as parents and educators, the educational system. So again, if you haven't yet, please take the time to watch the March webinar where Debbie shared the concepts underlying educational reform, 21st century skills, and how the classroom is a terrific spot to build cognitive programming into daily lessons and wellness. And today we're going to examine an aspect of those skills, what are often called foundational or core literacies. I mean, of course, intuitively, we know that our brains are central to our learning process and the acquisition of academic skills. And tonight we're going to examine the specifics of these skills and come to look at the implications and applications of a cognitive approach. So first, uh, a question for you. Now, my previous question was a seemingly innocent one, and you could answer how you chose. This question is really designed to be divisive. So there's only two options. You can't choose both. You can't choose neither. You either are or you aren't. And if you can't answer immediately, I suggest you put yourself sort of into the classroom, maybe when you were 10, 12 years old, and answer from that perspective. So Emily, if you could share the poll with us now. One choice, you are a math person or you are not a math person. Those of you in certain parts of the world may prefer me to phrase, you are a maths person or not a maths person, but either way, 
those are your options. Uh, I wonder if we can see that poll. And oh, wow, fascinating, right down the middle. Almost uh, a perfect balance between maths and non-maths people. Well, that should make things interesting tonight. But in risk of sounding hostile, there is no such thing as a maths person or not a maths person. At the very least, there doesn't have to be. Not these days, not anymore. Not the way science has uh, shown us about math and about learning and about ourselves. In fact, math has been around for a long time, long before that video, long before language. Our brains are hardwired with mathy functions. Think about the different math circuits that would have had to have been active when early humans were figuring out how to build shelter or how many berries needed to last them the winter. Even today, think about how early we consider math, how an infant can understand when something is taken away, subtraction well before they approach a math classroom. Toddlers know how intuitively how many Halloween candy seems to have disappeared overnight while they were sleeping. Our brains are built to be mathematical. Now, this is not to say math can be easily acquired. In fact, many around the world struggle to do so. Some of us here, 46 of us here perhaps, uh, percent of us, we know the consequences of poor math skills can extend beyond the classroom. One of the most compelling evidence of this was the mortgage crisis of 2008, a global recession. Watch the big short uh, for a great uh, portrayal of that. But economists uh, have identified that it was poor calculation skills that very likely caused the, uh, the dramatic impact there. So there's no doubt that Basic cognitive, uh, sorry, calculation skills are essential in today's world. Some research suggests that numeric skills are even a stronger predictor of success than reading abilities. Uh, Emily can put the, the study into this into the chat so you can have a read of that interesting perspective. So it's no wonder that there's labs throughout the world that look at the brain on math and they're coming to kind of the same conclusions. Uh, some thoughts here by neuroscientists and researchers in the field of, of the brain and mathematics and their interplay. Uh, Dr. Nzari says it's about multiple regions working in concert. The better they work in concert, the more essentially they speak to each other, the stronger the gains in numeric abilities. Dr. Evans out of the University of Virginia, who concludes that indeed differences in brain geography strongly affect how people develop in math. And encouragingly, a comment from Stanford by Dr. Menon, in order to masterly, masterfully acquire these skills, children need a great deal of cortical territory. And it's not just a math part of the brain, it's a network of regions. So while scientists are examining our math on brain from different perspectives, they all recognize that if you could kind of knock away a simple or complex problem to its pure form, to its lowest common denominator, to use the math pun, the brain is being asked two things, to calculate and to understand. And so there's two very specific and very important cognitive functions at play here. First, quantification and sense. Imagine, as much as we know there's no math part of our brain, imagine a calculator in our brain. Imagine the part of our brain that holds on to number, that has a sense of number, and therefore can manipulate it, can be comfortable with it. So it's the brain area that keeps holding and constantly manipulating number, which allows us really to have number sense and to have uh, application of numbers across many domains, including math facts, including calculating change or uh, uh, estimating the time, uh, estimating the amount of time something will take. It allows us to budget, it allows us to remember phone numbers, to, to uh, manage ourselves and manage any aspect of number because it's how we become comfortable with number in life. It's how we develop financial literacy. So this cognitive function, this quantification sense is 
needless to say, fundamental in mathematics. But before we can use our mind's calculator, or at the very least simultaneously, we have to figure out what we're calculating, which numbers, which operations. We have to make sense of the question. And the function that does that is our symbol relations. At its core, this is the network that is activated when we have to connect two or more ideas together to make sense of it. That one half is the same as five tenths, even though the numbers, uh, you know, the digits are utterly different. That 36 is not a three and a six, but three tens and six units. So we have, we're constantly being asked in mathematics to make sense of something, to understand or grasp the, uh, an idea. This is the brain area that reasons or gains insight. It allows us to be flexible and to make those connections. And it grasps math at a deeply semantic level. So you can definitely appreciate how important this function is. And in fact, the video that uh, I failed to show the audio for uh, gives a really neat insight into kind of the interplay between these two ideas that in fact is possible to have a very strong number sense or a very strong quantification sense. But if you're missing or have some sort of fundamental logic flaw, then the whole experience is uh, off kilter. So if one's symbol relations isn't strong enough to conceptually understand the task or to not necessarily understand the lack of logic around a process, um, then the math participation is uh, impacted. And this is why it's so powerful in mathematics, particularly to have students share how they worked it out. It's a clue to their thinking. It's a clue to their understanding. And it's the functions behind the uh, sheer process that really reveals their processing, or in some cases, the misunderstanding of their processing. So like any task, and as we've seen throughout this series, math can be seen as an outcome of the interplay between cognitive functions. These are the 19 functions used in our work, each designed to accomplish a really specific part of any given task. And certainly even the simplest math question requires number sense, pure number sense, and the conceptual aspects of math. But it's worth keeping in mind that these aren't the only functions involved in a typical math task. Other fun functions can be just as critical to support the completion of, of math problems. So in addition to, often we say the light bulb that goes off in our heads that we understand, that symbol relations, the calculator in our heads that holds and manipulates the number, there's a host of other functions at play here. Motor symbol sequencing is the mechanics of our eye tracking and of our hand. And I'm, I wanna revisit that in a moment. Uh, and beyond that, for all questions and tasks, we need to pay attention to it. We need to not get distracted. We need to make decisions and plan and persist. And these are qualities of our executive function, specifically our prefrontal cortex in our left and right hemispheres. Uh, these are functions that work together through language, and, uh, and non-verbally to stay focused and solve the task. There's also a, a logical or linear process inherent within mathematics. Think of the process of long division. That's our predicative speech here. And if there's any formulas that need to be memorized, our visual memory for symbols must be active. That's symbol recognition. It doesn't stop there, depending on the question, depending on the type of math. There's shape and space involved. The camera in our heads that perceives and remember details comes online. That's object recognition. Our short-term memory needs to be called upon if there's details that have to be held and recalled. In fact, some uh, research suggests that there's combinations of even some unknowns. Some researchers found that observing the brains of mathematicians, uh, they were using evolutionarily ancient knowledge of number and space, but certainly in higher maths, abject, abject, abstract reasoning, sorry, spatial reasoning, uh, lots of different things coming at play here, depending on the specific math task. I want to go back to 
again, one of the fundamental or core functions of many academic tasks, motor symbol sequencing. And as I said, this is the mechanics of our hand copying or forming letters or numbers and of our eye, the mechanics of our eye tracking those numbers or letters uh, in text. So this isn't a high order function. This isn't, uh, you know, uh, deep processing of, of the concept or, uh, or logic or reasoning, but it's critical because it's our, the mechanics of our eye tracking numbers accurately, including columns or decimals. And it's our hand as it copies and creates digits, either horizontally or vertically, including decimals or operation signs or the digits themselves. So motor symbol sequencing is a big piece of mathematics. So I'm going to ask you, I won't ask you in a uh, uh, poll this time because you may want to remain anonymous. But you there on the other side of the screen, as a student or an educator or a parent, raise your hand if you've ever looked at a piece of math effort and said to yourself, what a shame, if only it weren't for that careless error. So the question is, have we ever used the phrase careless error, particularly looking at a mathematical process? So I'm here to tell you, just as there's no such thing as a math person or not a math person, I wouldn't say there's no such thing as a careless error, but it certainly is far less uh, reality than often accused uh, of a student making a careless error. They did not care less. The vast majority of students care a lot, but with the cognitive function responsible for tracking their eyes smoothly across a series of digits or down a column or tracking a decimal point, even for a moment slipped, they could be misreading or miscopying or miswriting a digit and the calculation will be incorrect. So you can see here the students four in the division question as they pulled it down to uh, as per the process, that four just gently became a nine and in the end became incorrect. Similarly here, uh, there's probably a dual application of, of intention, but uh, missing it here in the second example, place value and also the dreaded columns. Uh, and if there is a, an issue with our motor symbol sequencing, the, the writing of it or our eye tracking it, we will make an error. So the next time you catch yourself about to comment on a careless error, call it a motor slip. And it may lead you or the person who slipped think differently about the error, even about themselves. So I'm gonna pause there. Uh, I wonder as we have so many parents and educators in the room tonight, whether something's resonating with you. If you're thinking about experiences in the classroom, or at the dining table during homework, where you can see those distinctions, uh, those different cognitive functions at play. For example, a student who frequently says, it doesn't make sense, I don't get it. Could you go over that again? Or something similar? That may be a comprehension component. Or if the student's written work tended not to reflect their understanding or their computation that you hear or see verbally, that's their motor planning possibly impacting their written work. Or do you see if you pose a question to your child verbally, but they need to jot down their calculation, that might be a mental number sense piece at play here. Or do they need the material broken down into small steps? That's an executive function element that's involving those prefrontal lobes. So the more we use the distinct role of cognitive functions in learning tasks, the more we can use it to understand the student's experience or even shape our expectations differently. Kind of ask ourselves, what do we want to evaluate here? Uh, a student's number sense or their conceptual understanding or their penmanship <laughs> or their memory of names of the formulas. It, it might depend. And if we approach these or tasks differently, uh, then we may come up with some different 
uh, answers or alternatives. All right. Some an interesting comment in the chat was when way back when you asked um, if pe people are a math person or not a math person. Um, someone commented, "I thought I was a math person until I had to learn geometry and trigonometry." Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. I think it points to what you're talking about in terms of the different cognitive functions that are involved in various mathematical tasks. I just thought I'd mention that. Oh, and Debbie, this is not planned, of course, but you could not have mentioned that at a better time. First of all, thank you to our guest who uh, identified that and contributed that. Uh, and you might be the perfect person who might be particularly interested in this uh, one slide away because we will talk more deeply about that. But absolutely, uh, to some extent, there's a uh, developmental or even grade by grade scaffolding that we see at play here uh, early in school. Uh, the expectations, the mathematical curriculum is quite concrete in nature. And though at some point, uh, in this case, it was trigonometry, in other points, it may be earlier, fractions, for example, where we're being asked more, the, there's more cognitive functions at play, we're being asked to move away from concrete into conceptual, uh, we, may change, we may change our own self-concept. Very interesting. Well, speaking of self-concept, uh, I this slide, I brings us back, those of you who have joined us in previous webinars when we've discussed our cognitive profiles, um, I want you to keep in mind that across our cognitive profiles, made up of these very specifically designed intellectual networks, uh, we operate differently within each of those functions. So leading to this unique combination of strengths and weaknesses. So I do really want us to keep in mind that each of these different functions or processes that we'll talk about uh, can be measured. Uh, in our work, we use a 12 point scale that can determine the degree of capacity that any one function is operating. So keeping in mind that we're all somewhere along this continuum. We also, as mathematicians, we also know from previous webinars and in the growing field of neuroscience that our brains can be improved upon. That through neuroplastic or cognitive training, not only can our brains in general stay healthy and active, but they can start from wherever we are on this continuum uh, to be improved upon, to be enhanced. So those particularly that are essential in academic development, but certainly throughout our lives. So uh, for particularly perhaps for elementary or specialist math teachers out there, dissecting math through this cognitive lens uh, can really be an interesting process. It may change your perspective. It may lead you to recognize, as our uh, friend in the chat did, that some math is much more uh, uh, much different, much more complex than others, and maybe you want to see it differently, teach it differently, evaluate it differently. So one of the labs uh, examining math right now, examining math very closely, is out of Stanford University in California, where Dr. Joe Bowler is based. And Dr. Bowler hosted a webinar with members of the Aerosmith team a few years ago. And this webinar went into much greater detail than I am now about mathematics and particularly looking at the different strains of mathematics and the different cognitive functions or networks of functions that are at play there. So Emily will put uh, that video into the chat. As I said, it's great for teachers, but I think anyone who's curious about math or themselves uh, can really lead to some neat conversations or neat contemplations, uh, particularly about the people you know and the uniqueness of our cognitive profile within a classroom, what's happening in the brain of one student will be different than that of another. It might be slightly different, but it might be radically. So given the, the typical math problem, even in the first or second grade requires at least three, six different cognitive functions to be at play. And each student's cognitive profile is going to be a unique combination of functioning. I mean, that's a permutation question right there, right? Some of you, perhaps, was it 56% of you may already be seeing the formula for that permutation question. 
So 12 point scale across, let's say six different functions. Let's say there's 25 students in the class. If we can get a correct answer out of that diff those different combinations, please put it in the chat. Uh, we will have to consult some of the <laughs> more mathically minded people on staff, but we will celebrate a the first correct answer to be sure. Uh, so back to Dr. Bowler, um, she's someone who's really motivated to transform math education so that children have a better chance of becoming maths people like us. She wholly rejects the idea that you're either a math person or not. And she looks at math from a neurological perspective, not only what the brain is doing uh, while it's involved in mathematical processes, but how we can support children's experiences in more positive ways. Something we'll look at later in the session, how we can change our neurological or cognitive capacity to access math more efficiently. Dr. Bowler has a terrific book, Limitless Mind. I'd really recommend you adding it to your list. Uh, we've had some terrific conversations actually with teaching teams in school boards who have had this book as part of their professional development. Um, and it's led them to some interesting conversations and kind of some motivation to transform their own teaching, even systematically to look at how they're supporting their students. Another great resource in the math world is John Mighton, a mathematician from the University of Toronto, who founded the Jump Math Program. Now, this is an academic program, but a lot of the teachers we work with see it as a great complement to cognitive programming. So Emily will put a link to the Jump Math organization in chat. So lots of great work out there really urging school systems to bring the brain into the classroom. So I thought we'd share uh, a little bit about what happens when schools do this. Because, of course, school's primary function is to teach uh, and to ensure students are learning fundamental academic skills to prepare them for life. But there's also a growing number of schools around the world who have integrated cognitive programming into their students' daily schedules. Their administration also recognized that they're preparing their students' brain in targeted ways to learn more efficiently is probably worthwhile. So let's look at the academic impact of a cognitive or neuroplastic approach. So we'll start here in Toronto, one of the public school boards uh, here, which offered cognitive programming to several of their schools, they wanted to measure the academic impact of their students, particularly because their students were spending uh, a good amount of time, half of their day in cognitive programming, which is something to keep in mind. These were students uh, spending a limited amount of time in academic classes, for the most part, uh, for half of their day, were uh, involved in cognitive strengthening exercises that were targeting the processes that underlie, uh, in this case, math and literacy. And the researcher found that with a changed cognitive capacity, there was a direct change to the rate with which they acquired academic skills. Now, these were students who were not making a grade gain per year, as we expect students to do. In fact, they were falling farther behind their peers with each year. But after one year of cognitive programming, they doubled and tripled their rate of learning in these scores of word recognition, of math, of comprehension, of reading speed. So this really supports the idea that when our brains are working more effectively, learning is more uh, efficient, it's easier. More specifically, when core functions responsible for academic skills are strengthened, they start doing their job in learning and accelerate those learners' experiences. So these and other studies can be found on our website. Emily, dear Emily, we'll put a link in the chat so you can read more about them on your own time. Uh, and certainly a clear example of what happens when schools dedicate to move scientifically proving programming into their classrooms and into their students' daily experiences. Uh, another example of this uh, at a different school, this was in Washington State, they were also interested in how their students performed in academic measures if they spent a period of day not in academic remediation, but in cognitive training. So they had families opt their children into their study and the students participated in the symbol relations exercise, the one that targets and strengthens the parts of our brain that understand, that reasons, that 
processes information. Uh, by the way, and Emily may have already done this, uh, there was a blog recently published on this particular cognitive function. So if she hasn't already, I know Emily would be happy to share that blog. Uh, so the question at, at Gateway uh, in Washington State was, will the students who are working on a cognitive exercise, uh, will it impact standardized measures of academics? And they use the, the uh, CAT, the California Achievement Chess Test, and the measure of academic process progress the map, which are well-known tests used uh, often in this uh, stateside school systems. And the results were clear uh, and it makes sense. The students targeted the brain function responsible for understanding, which is an intellectual process that has implications across everything we do and certainly these academic domains. So these were all the areas that increased after cognitive training, vocabulary, reading comprehension, math computation, math concepts, problem solving, and across all measures of math reading and language. There's something more I want to show here because in addition to the standardized academic measures, these students were also required to complete a, a self-evaluation, which was compiled and analyzed, and the vast majority of students reported significant improvements themselves. 95% of students reported being faster at math, able to grasp math concepts more quickly, 86% improve, uh, reported improved comprehension. This would all be in the uh, research link you can find if you want to spend a bit more time with these numbers. And in general, they saw themselves as better students. Look at the language here. I want to draw your attention to some of these phrases. I am able. I am better. I am faster. I am more attentive. They saw themselves differently. So these are schools using the science to give their students uh, a chance to build better brains for themselves and very likely a better future. And I think importantly, they're going a step further. They're chipping away at that math fallacy. At last, uh, at least rather for this class, uh, for these students and this year, these are students who may never need to see themselves as someone for whom math just isn't their thing. And that's a really compelling idea. So while our brains have been hardwired, as I mentioned, for numeric relationships, remember kind of prehistoric times, uh, and, and of course that these brains can be changed and enhanced to be even more efficient, other cognitive academic skills, sorry, other academic skills are much less intuitive. In sharp, contrast. No child develops the capacity to read uh, or write intuitively, or at least not without explicit teaching and repeated exposure. And there's an evolutionary explanation for this. Human brains were not designed to read. There's no reading center of the brain. There's no reading genes. Instead, in order to read, each brain must change. It must fashion new circuits. So the truth is, the act of reading is really hard. <laughs> Millions of people around the world have not been able to acquire this skill. Now, there's complex economic and social reasons why these numbers are high, but it can't be dismissed that some portion of those millions of people who are considered illiterate or simply poor readers, it's not due to social or economic reasons, certainly not due to a lack of intelligence or effort. It's not the blame of their teachers or invested parents. It's because reading requires a strong capacity in specific combination of cognitive functions in order to be acquired. Uh, in the first place, just merely acquired, and then importantly to be automated and eventually to be enjoyed. So if we take reading down uh, again to its kind of core, we need to decode, understand, and apply. And there's different ways that reading can be dissected. Certainly there's lots of uh, great uh, work out there in different labs and clinics and schools. I've always loved this one, the Scarborough Reading Rope graphic. It's rec recognized by practitioners uh, because it focuses kind of the interwoven areas of word recognition and language comprehension as being critical in developing skilled readers. And the reason why 
this works so nicely uh, for, for us tonight is it gives an appreciation that there's a lot happening at the fundamental level to form that specialized circuit of decoding and also to move into the understanding of what it is we're reading and that both are critical to really get that circuit running lightning fast, uh, to, to be running automatically, to move from that uh, learning to read to reading to learn construct. So through the analysis of more specific cognitive functions, we're gonna dig a little bit deeper. First of all, into the fundamentals of decoding. Now this was a blood flow study. So look at what happens in a person's brain when they're asked to read out loud. And we're gonna look at these pieces uh, through our cognitive framework. So at first glance, remember just decoding, our eye needs to track across uh, the, the letters of a word. That's that the mechanics of our eye tracking. We have to pronounce the word. That's what we call broca speech pronunciation. If we don't uh, or can't pronounce, we also have to rely on the visual look of the word, our symbol recognition. Uh, we have to know the word itself. We have to remember the meaning of the word, our lexical memory. Uh, as things come into play, we also have to keep in mind, uh, sorry, it's gonna click again. We also have to keep in mind some of the higher order components to understanding what it is we're reading, to pay attention to what it is we're reading, to remember what it is we have read. So let's look a little deeper at some of the, those uh, mechanics. Motor simple sequencing in the context of mathematics largely relied upon, remember, avoiding careless errors. Are our eyes tracking the numbers accurately in mathematics? Well, this same cognitive function plays a critical role in reading. We have to catch each letter, uh, each punctuation each word, we have to catch the, the uh, uh, text line so that we don't lose our place. So a critical mechanical aspect of decoding. Similarly critical is our phonemic awareness, our, uh, our ability to hold on to sound, to remember that sound and to manipulate that sound. So good phonics programs rely heavily on this cognitive function. It's a critical piece to decoding. And our symbol recognition, we have to know what that word looks like. We have to take a picture of that word. It's the camera in our head. So uh, it's right back here in our left hemisphere. And it takes a picture of a word so that when we see that word again, we match the word on the page to the picture we've taken in our head. So critical for are decoding and at some point also important to for spelling. Now let's keep in mind, remember each of us possess a certain combination of capacity across these functions. So I'm just gonna look at a couple of uh, here because it's going to impact our experience depending on our capacity. Uh, my colleagues here tonight will know that I've chosen broke the speech pronunciation just to share my own experience. I have a significant deficit in this function. Uh, so spell check does not even recognize my efforts because I have such a fragile sense of the, the sounds of words. But fortunately, I could rely heavily on my uh, symbol recognition, my visual memory. So I'm higher up on the continuum with this particular uh, function. So it has a direct impact on the outcome, on the uh, uh, skill, the academic skill that relies on this particular combination of concepts. So even with strong decoding, our brains are constantly asked to make connections between the words and ideas. So if the words uh, even if the words aren't there. So reading between the lines, in the induendo uh, metaphor, these are devices that call upon our symbol relation. So you'll recognize this again in mathematics. This was the brain area that processes the, the, the logic of the math process or makes sense between the, uh, the concepts of the mathematics. In literacy, this is the brain area 
that allows us to understand what it is we're reading. And we can be excellent decoders. We can have beautiful pronunciation. We can never lose our place. But if we find ourselves having to reread something a couple of times before it clicks, if it helps to have a, a, a visual representation of a concept before it's clear, then there is space on this continuum for us to improve it upon. So while we weren't born to read, it doesn't mean our brains can't rise to the challenge. Uh, it was shaped over millions of years of sequential adaptation in response to ever-changing environmental demands. So speaking of ever-changing demands, this is, of course, where Debbie took us last month, where she examined the ways many think tanks and leaders are calling on educational reform, including creating more synergy between science and our schools. Uh, another important researcher in this field of neuroscience is Dr. Dehan. He's a French author and, and brain scientist. And his work looks at education and specific academic skills, including reading and mathematics. Uh, so in addition to reading in the brain, the, the book shown here, he also wrote a book called The Number Sense. So his work is very aligned with what we're talking about here today. His work is also a bit of a rallying cry, urging educators and educational systems to pay attention to this science. Uh, he talks about it in a clip that Emily, thank you for sharing in the chat. Uh, and some of his work is referenced in The Woman Who Changed uh, Her Brain. That's uh, Aerosmith's founder's book in a chapter entitled A Closed Book. Uh, so Dr. Dehan's work and leadership um, is also timely here in Ontario uh, because the, the province's Ministry of Education has been called into action. Uh, earlier this year, the Ontario Human Rights Commission released a report following, I think it was a couple of years, uh, it started in 2019, so are we three years now, uh, following a three-year study into the state of reading in Ontario's public education system. And, and unfortunately found the system was falling short by not using evidence-based approaches to teach reading. And the report made a number of urgent recommendations uh, to the Ministry of Ed so that they could ensure that school boards and faculties of education, which is really important to are start to make some systematic changes to how we teach reading. Uh, now this was in Ontario, but uh, some suggestion that this is a much more universal experience. Um, and the, the really, again, the recommendation to use what science has taught us to uh, evolve the curriculum. Now I should say that while this inquiry was initially focused on students who struggle to read, those with learning difficulties. Uh, many experts in the field, uh, like Dr. Cunningham, saw that this wasn't limited to those with learning issues, that a great number of students in any given classroom are lacking a baseline of literacy. So a really important opportunity for all students and all professionals in education uh, Emily, thank you for putting the report, this particular report, into the chat. Uh, I think it's worthwhile, whether you're in Ontario or not, there's a great amount of insight in here. Again, for parents and teachers, uh, one of the biggest issues in, in today and kind of the common approach is this idea of cueing the reader. So giving the reader clues, strategies to read the word by what pictures do they see or what are the words around the, uh, the challenging word to give us clues instead of actually decoding the word. So this is a really exciting time for those of us who have seen for quite some time now the impact of targeting these specific cognitive functions, particularly of decoding, the phonemic aspect, the visual memory aspect, even the eye tracking, as well as those higher order functions of comprehension and, and processing. So for example, this is a study uh, where students were followed by a lab based at the University of British Columbia uh, while they targeted their cognitive capacity through neuroplastic exercise. And, and you can see their performance in these specific academic domains improved significantly. 
So, you know, while the circuits that are involved in reading uh, is known, and we can improve those circuits through training, I, this is really a reflection of the educational reform that's being asked of the ministry. And I will say schools and, and systems around the world kind of behooves our systems to look at the science of learning and elevate our teaching approaches because of it. Uh, in these schools that do offer cognitive programming, there's actually great synergy between the cognitive teachers and the academic teachers that the cognitive classrooms are preparing the student's brain to hold and manipulate sound, for example. And then the academic teachers are using effective phonics-based curriculum, for example, to ensure that the students uh, use their new strength to read and spell. And these are the scores that are accelerating. The, the, once the brain's visual and phonological circuits are online and working effectively, the, you see it in the learning. This is another uh, research study from a lab the University of Calgary, following students from different schools, but all students in a cognitive programming, uh, uh, underlying the, the, sorry, improving the underlying function related to learning and the whole capacity to learn comes on board more easily, shown here in significant improvements in reading, mathematics, writing, and receptive language. Finally, not a study, uh, but some feedback that I think really shows the power of cognitive programming belonging in schools and, and the impact of this, of this lens of looking at academic skills and performance uh, as a combination of specific cognitive functioning. Uh, this is from uh, a grade seven student who spent a year in a cognitive program in their school and their teacher who simply observed uh, their shifting experience over the course of the year. And this is compelling to me uh, because as a former teacher, I know too often I made a decision about a student uh, and didn't necessarily expect that judgment to shift significantly during my time with them. And as a former student, I still have war wounds from the moment that I felt like I couldn't achieve or felt that a certain subject or task just wasn't something I could manage. So I continued to be inspired by this. Uh, the teacher reports, this student demonstrates greater confidence in approaching learning activities. Reading and writing reveal steady improvement. Mental math skills continue to improve and they demonstrate a real willingness to take risks. It's the student's concept that really, uh, uh, quote rather, that really inspires me and reminds me that we really can shape our own destiny of achievement and possibility. They describe, one of my biggest improvements has been math. It's not as hard as it used to be. And I'm one of the best in the class. I find math fun and challenging. Fun and challenging. And this is a very different brain approaching that particular classroom these days. So for those of you with children or in education, I really hope that you make sure your children and your students are part of this conversation, this fact that our brains can change and that as learners at whatever age, or starting, uh, whatever starting capacity on that continuum, we can continue to improve, that our brains were designed to change so we can directly impact the types of brains we have. And it's uh, really worth the conversation, uh, encouraging us all to consider the kind of the not yet approach to learning. Uh, Carol Dweck, many of you know uh, how her growth mindset uh, has developed. So like Carol Dweck, like Dr. Bowler uh, mentioned earlier today, like John Mighton and others in the field, we know that change is possible both in mindset and physiologically. You know, our minds and our brains, they're related, but they are different. <laughs> Absolutely, we must have the confidence to see ourselves as learning and changing and pursuing and challenging ourselves and our growth. And we can also ideally 
have the opportunity to build what we call cognitive competence that through neuroplastic training with cognitive competence comes the confidence, which is a really meaningful learning experience. Finally, we want to invite you to our next webinar uh, set for May 17th. This will be the last in this series um, and one that in some respects takes us kind of back to the beginning uh, and through each theme of our series uh, that given our brains play such a critical role in everything we do, maybe we should have a user guide for it to help us understand the why between everything we do. So we're going to discuss the value of this perspective, how we can measure functioning through a cognitive assessment, how this assessment is different from traditional evaluations, and why it might further enrich our experiences in life. So dear Emily, we'll pop the registration uh, for our next webinar into the chat, and we really hope you'll join us. So that's all from me. I'm going to leave some uh, resources here on the page. Any uh, compelling questions or thoughts or comments you might have now, please put them into our Q&A box. Uh, if we have time, we will answer one or two of them. But as I said at the top, please be assured that we will also answer any questions we don't gather tonight. Debbie, I wonder, is there, do you think we have time for any questions that have come in over the course of the session? I think so, Tara. There are right. a couple I think that lots of people might find interesting. Um, one is, what's the difference between conceptualization and number sense? Uh, the comment was that I thought you would need number sense in order to conceptualize. So it's a good question. Mm, mm, mm. So I would say that rarely is, in general, rarely is any one function operating in isolation. So I would say your, your hunch is kind of right, that there's an absolute interplay between those discrete functions. Uh, what is different about them is uh, what we call quantification sense or uh, generically number sense is our, it's almost like our memory for number, the, 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 uh, our ability to hold on to number as its own entity. So to, uh, at a very base level, to hold on to one number four. Uh, at the next level to, to move from four to five or to hold that four and one is five. Now, you're right, you're probably uh, already making the comment. Well, but there's a, a concept there. There's a conceptual piece there of understanding what it means to add one. Uh, uh, and you're right. that So uh, again, right away or almost uh, simultaneously, there's other brain areas, symbol relations at play here. So while there is a very distinct role that those two brain areas play, one is holding and uh, uh, remembering number and kind of playing with number, our ability to understand what to do with that number is the conceptual piece there. Um, so, so, you know, uh, most everything we do is requiring those two cognitive functions in mathematics, particularly those two cognitive functions to, to be playing, uh, very closely together. Um, there is a very interesting example, um, Emily, if you could make a note, uh, we will send it your way or add it to the list of resources, uh, a great a uh, great uh, place to start learning more about this is on the website where we've described each of those cognitive functions in detail related to that, the woman who changed her brain, the, the specific chapters that look at these two functions. Uh, but there's also a great article that uh, features uh, some of Dr. DeHeim's work. And when he was working with an individual who had an injury to his number sense, but not to his conceptual uh, abilities. 
So his understanding was there, but his ability to, to hold on to even a simple one or two digit was so fragile, it would, he couldn't maintain it. So some really interesting case studies uh, of how different people's cognitive profiles shape their relationship with math. I hope that helps. That's, thank you so much, Tara. This is, it's not a follow-up question from the same person, but it's, it is one that quite often we hear, and this might have to be our last one, but not to discourage people from adding their questions into the Q&A. Um, but this one is, which cognitive function does the brain use for word problem in maths? And of course, we have is the student reading the word problem or is the word problem being told to the, all of those pieces that come into mathematics learning, not necessarily um, the teaching of mathematics. So I'll leave that with you. Yeah, it's a, it's a great comment and one that's really, uh, it, that becomes the featured question of Joe Bowler's and Aerosmith's webinar uh, on U-Cubed. So if you go to the U-Cubed link that you'll find uh, and really spend, I think it's a 40 minute presentation, uh, analyzing that much more deeply. So analyzing a word problem, uh, as Debbie says, there's a, obviously a strong literacy component to that. So all of the cognitive functions that are involved in uh, reading, decoding the question, understanding the question, and only then applying the, the number sense to it. So some really great material there if you want to dive into it further. So thank you again for uh, joining us tonight. Thank you so much, everyone, for your questions. Tara, thank you so much. Thank you. We'll see you next time, everyone. Bye.